Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, good. good to be back with our boy, Ben. And so, I'll start with the court to get back.
All right, good to see everyone here back at church tonight. For those of you that came and those of you that are tuning in on the internet, I'm glad you're able to make us part of your night tonight. And uh, I want to apologize for my mic here. I uh, appreciate those trying to help out in the sound, but we're having some static problems. How many heard that this morning? Some of you heard the static problems this morning. I apologize for that. It came over the internet that way too. And we're just trying to work uh, on the kinks that are in the system here and hopefully get them resolved as soon as as soon as possible. Again, encourage everyone to be back Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. What's next Sunday? Round, round up Sunday. And the dress Western, bring out your cowboy hats, boots, all your Western gear, if you got any. And uh, the objective, though, is to round up people and bring them into church visitors-wise. So hope you can do that uh, this coming Sunday, one week from today, for the Sunday morning service. Continue to share. Uh, those of you that have Facebook, continue to share our Heritage Baptist Church Facebook page. And again, those that do, uh, I appreciate you doing that. And uh, hopefully get these kinks worked out again, internet-wise, too, for the PA. Uh, again, keep Tim and Bron Brenda, Brenda Potter in prayer, having some health issues today. So help pray that the Lord will help them out on that. Naomi, uh, Naomi Rayborn and her leukemia. All right, Brother Kurt Roberts is going to come. He's going to read our scripture for us tonight and then pray. No, nah, not really. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, turn your Bibles tonight, please, to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Beginning in verse 21, when we get there. Luke 11, beginning in verse 21. When it's thrown up, when a strong man armed keepeth his place, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, and overcome him, he takes away from him his armor where he trusted, and his life is spoiled. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me is scattered. When the end of the spirit is gone out of the man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house, and I came up. And when he come up, he finds it swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh to him uh, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. They enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worth the place. Lord, we've got much in front of you. You know the past work. You've been in every part of the place. We know you by the practice of the uh, powerful darkness of the city, Lord. We just ask your father to uh, they turned every device on this, on the cause of darkness and darkness here in world. And your world be totally done in the election. I would just ask that you will all come be done here in this uh, service tonight. Lord. We just open your word and we just ask that you will put it up in our hearts and keep it all in all we call in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's all stand one more time. Page 153. Page 153, we'll sing I'm the Rod. See the first and the last of page 153.
singing tonight. How many can hear me from this mic? Is it picking up pretty good? All right, good. All right. Uh, tonight again, I'm, uh, before I go on, is anybody too hot in here? Are some plants, some of, are a few of you are a little too warm. All right, a few, a few too hot. How many, anybody too cool? Too cool? A couple, couple cool. All right, more warm than cool. All right. A lot of you are cool, but a little cold temperature-wise, we know that. I try to aim to please. I think it's set on 73, 73. Some of you make it like ice cubes in your home, I know. Some of you like it warm, so I try to stay in the middle. To, I try to please, aim to please. That's where I'm getting at, so try to make everybody happy. You always can't please everybody. You guys realize that. And uh, tonight, again, we're on the subject of God and guns. We've been on... With the election coming up, I try to hit head on through the through the scripture, all the various subjects of the issues that are going on. I try to get it to us from God's perspective right here, and uh, just so we kind of of know know this that um, I'm a fundamentalist first and foremost. I try to get the various fundamentals here of of the Word of God. And you got to be careful. You can't believe, that's a shock, you can't believe everything you hear from the media. Just, just thought I'd throw that out, out there for us. You can't believe everything. The media sometimes has collapsed economies. This is George Soros has collapsed several countries, if you would, and is not allowed in many countries because of that. And uh, there's a lot of things you hear and see is not always accurate. The Word of God always is, though. And that's what we're going to kind of look at again tonight on, on this subject here. And some of the fundamentals of the Word of God. First uh, Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible talks about a man that's supposed to provide for his own. And provide, that means in food, raiment. And I also believe... That's referring to protection. You're supposed to provide protection for, for your family as well. And tonight again, we're talking about God and guns. Samuel Adams said, The Constitution shall never be uh, construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arm. That means guns. Thomas Jefferson, same thing. George Washington's, how many know who George Washington was? Okay, just we're checking. First president of the United States said, Firearms stand next in importance to the Constitution itself. He knew what he was talking about. James Madison, similar quote I have. Patrick Henry, the great object is that every man be armed. Everyone who is able may have a gun. 
even Van Gogh. Turn to Romans chapter 12, by the way, as I'm quoting Van Gogh, who even said, the right to bear arms is the right to be free. The right to bear arms is the right to be free. I love being free in the greatest country in the world, the United States. And I'm thankful for our freedoms. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 and verse number 18. One verse here we'll look at. Romans chapter 12 and verse 18. Kurt, if you could go ahead and read that one verse for us tonight. If it be possible, much as lieth in you, live peacefully with all men. Very good. How many of you like being at peace with other people? You like that? Yeah, I do. And uh, I know some people are like, well, they like to fight and, you know, they just don't mind getting in controversy with one against another. And I like being at peace with people. And God says, you know, that we, we should. We're supposed to be kind to people, get along with people. Uh, some believe that we shouldn't even fight as a country. Those in the Jehovah's false witness religion and that's not scriptural and that's not right that's wrong you should fight for what's right fight for the truth and the, the truth is you know if everybody was saved and walked in the spirit you would not need a gun it's kind of cut to the chase but how many realize this not everybody in this world is saved they're not. Yeah, they're not. And some that are saved, not every one of those that are saved, always walk in the Spirit. There's some that don't. So therefore, according to the Bible, you need a gun for various reasons we'll get in tonight. And I believe we should all strive for peace. But there's a difference between being a peacemaker and a pansy. Big difference. There's a big difference. To strive for peace, strive to get along. Matthew 5 said, blessed are the peacemakers. You should strive for peace. But also, when there's issues that rise up that aren't right, that aren't scriptural, and that aren't right for your family, your church, your country, you need to take a stand. Stand on, on right. Ephesians 6.13 Having done all, stand. I'm talking about God and guns. My first point simply is this. Man has a right and a duty to carry a gun to protect his home, family, and country. Now we were in Luke chapter number 11. Oh, that's a good point I just said. You're still with me. Let me repeat that again. Every man has a right and duty to carry a gun to protect his home, family, and country. Our duty. In Luke chapter number 11, we read that a little bit ago, the man there is, uh, he's armed. And the reason he's armed is to protect, you could say, protect his palace. That means his home. How many of you enjoy your home? Enjoy your home. Yeah, it should be your, like your safety net. You go to work, you go to school, or you go to wherever you go to, like a, a get together and go on vacation. How many are with me? By the time you go on vacation, it's been a while since I've been on one, but you go on vacation, isn't it good, no matter if you're going for like a few days or a week or two weeks, isn't it always just something special about coming home? It's just, you know, just something special. It's a good feeling to be able to come home. And that should be, that should be like your palace, your protection, your, your go-to place. And God says here, a man's supposed to protect his palace, his home. First Kings chapter number 12, we won't go on into it, but God told David, you can take care of your tent. Tent is like your palace, or it's your home. God told David to take care of it. Genesis 14, Abraham was concerned about his nephew, taking care of it. And Ab Abraham knew in Genesis 14, he had a responsibility to protect his family. That's only a freedom of ours, but my first point is we have a duty to protect our home, our family, our country. Second, man has a duty 
to protect himself even. In fact, I want to go to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, first book of the New Testament. Matthew chapter 26. Pick it up in verse 51. This is one of these verses here and passages that always has, has intrigued me. Intrigued me, Matthew 26 and verse number 51. Matthew 26, verse 51. Brother Kurt, if you had to read Matthew 26 and 51 for us, please. Oh, one of them on Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Very good. Thank you much. Now this disciple was Peter. If you remember the story, Roman soldiers, they were coming to arrest Jesus. And Peter didn't like what they were doing to the Lord. And he was defending Jesus, which all of us should be willing to do. So what Peter did, he, he took out a weapon, a gun maybe in our day, but in his day it was a sword. He took out a sword, and he went out to one of the Roman soldiers whose name happened to be Malchus. He took out a sword, and he just started swinging it. It was almost like, here you go. And by the way, he wasn't aiming for Malchus's ear. You've never heard one more word, but it all comes your ear. He, that was what he was going for, you know, on that note. He was coming for his head. And all of a sudden, Malchus, his ear flops on the ground because Peter took the sword, his weapon that he had for his day, and chopped off the ear. He missed the neck, but he got the ear of Malchus that laid on the ground. And how many were like, been, there's an ear on the ground? It'd be kind of, you know, kind of freak you out a little bit, probably. But here's Malchus, the Roman soldier. His ear is on the ground. And here's the Lord. And the Lord comes up. He kind of says to Peter, He said, You need to learn how to use your weapon. I'm paraphrasing it now. Learn how to use your sword. Learn how to use your gun in our day. But learn how to use your weapon. And Jesus went. He picked up the ear. He went over to Malchus. And there's not a, not a lot of big deal made about this, but there should be. He took the ear off of another human being and just put it back on like it was nothing. How many of you have been amazed at that? Pretty good. Back on like it was nothing. Now, I got my finger cut off in the eighth grade with a snowblower. And my doctor, I, after the... Taken to the ER, he came over and he sewed this thing back on. But wasn't for sure it was going. It wasn't healed immediately like Malthus's ear. It took like weeks and months, and eventually it took. And I have a finger that's here with no feeling in it at all. But it eventually it took. Now Malthus's ear was like back on, like it was nothing, like it was never taken off. But here again, Jesus told Peter, "You need to learn." how to use your weapon. Learn how to use it. So, protection for your home and your family. Protection for yourself. The Bible teaches to need to have a weapon there to be able to protect your country. Protect your country. Over and over and over again. Our country was needed. Things were needed for protection there. First Samuel Chapter number 17. The great story of David and who, everyone? Goliath. The story here of David and Goliath. At that moment in time, the Philistine giant was the aggressor, and he had to be stopped. David, the little teenage boy, he went to take some food to his brothers, and the giant Goliath was kind of mocking the Israelites, and David came over. Little shepherd boy, and said these famous words, Is there not a cause? And the cause was needed for a country to be protected. And so we know the story. David took a slingshot and five stones and used the first one and shot Goliath between the eyes and knocked him down. Took another person's weapon there, sword, and chopped his head off, knew what he was doing for the trophy. He had victory of the Philistine giant. The giant 
The enemy is the one that declared war. War on the Israelites. That's why, you know, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, sometimes there is a time for peace and there's a time for war. And guns are needed, you know, for uh, protection for a country as well. The Constitution grants us the freedom, the right to bear arms. The right to carry a gun. As I mentioned at the beginning tonight, our founding fathers knew what they were doing at the beginning of our country, and it's still needed today. Turn, if you would, to Second Chronicles chapter number 7. Second Chronicles chapter number 7 and verse number 14. Am I here to say tonight, church, that guns are what is going to turn our country around? No, I'm not saying that. But guns are needed for freedom. For freedom. Freedom we have to be able to come to church tonight. How many are glad to get the freedom to come to church tonight? Yeah, I'm thankful that you took upon that freedom and you came to church tonight. I'm glad every one of you that were here. Some of me come back tonight that maybe don't normally come. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the folks that come to church Sunday morning, back Sunday night, and have church Wednesday. I'm thankful for the freedoms we have to have round up Sunday next Sunday. I'm thankful. You know, no one told me, Pastor, you get the whole church to dress up Western. There's not one person that told me that. In fact, some people told me they don't like round up Sunday. They feel guilty if they don't dress up Western because that's the theme for the day. But hey, that's all right. Hey, next Sunday, just be an old Scrooge and don't dress up Western. That's all right. Don't worry about it. But at least come to church. Freedom to come to church. Freedom to go out and invite anybody we want to come to church. That's where it's all about. The, the hope for our country is not in guns, but freedom to talk about the things we're going to be talking about tonight. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, a verse we've talked about often here. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break it down just a little bit. Brother Kurt, do you mind reading that whole verse, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, and will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God's talking about his people. How many say, that's me, I'm a... I'm a believer. You're saved on your way to heaven. Because it says, says of my people right here. He kind of goes through a little bit of a spill here and breaks it down. I'm going to do that tonight. If my people, us believers. By the way, there is an election coming up. You've heard me say that several times the past few weeks and again this morning. But it is a big one. Big one that's coming up on Tuesday, November the 3rd. The election to come up of freedom versus non-freedom. And we have a decision to make, just like a decision's made here in 2 Chronicles 7.14. Are we going to do what's right? Are we going to vote? By the way, we're supposed to all vote. We're supposed to all be saying, man, I don't, I don't like none of them. We're supposed to vote anyway. We're supposed to, what you've heard me say the last couple Wednesdays, vote the one that lines up most with the Word of God. Can I get an amen on that? That's Bible. You'll hear me talk about it a little more. But tonight, again, a decision needs to be made like what we need to be made in, th in three weeks or so. God says, if my people, and he breaks it down here, he tells us that we need to do four things here. He says, if, I, if my people shall humble themselves. Humble themselves. Someone out there in here maybe, you know, listen, say, no, I don't. I don't like that thing about a gun. I already told us here about a gun. It's our responsibility for protection. For protection for our, our country, our home, our family. But God says here what we must do is humble ourselves. Now, how do you do that? What does that mean? Humble yourselves. Here's what that means, church. It actually means you get to the point in your life where you realize it doesn't matter what you think. 
What matters is what God says. And there's a lot of people out there, they think highly of their own opinion. Opinion sells today, if you don't think it does, there's talk radio that makes millions. On other people, listen to other people just talk about their opinion. I personally, I like Glenn Beck, if you ever listen to him. The mind to know. He tells his opinion. For the next three hours, some of you may listen to Rush Limbaugh. From noon to three, he talks about, by the way, from Glenn Beck on nine to noon, he's somebody who gets a lot of guests. And basically, from noon to three, Rush Limbaugh, he talks himself for three hours about subjects of the day. He has a huge audience to listen to him. So I don't like the political scene. You turn on ESPN. By the millions of people tune in to watch them talk about sports for hours. But God says what well, we must do is we must humble ourselves. And that simply means this. Get to the point where your opinion doesn't matter. We to break down the Word of God. We look about the election again. The election of where does the Bible stand on certain principles? How many have heard me talk about an issue the last three weeks? An issue. Thank you, I have. I talked about abortion. Then I talked about taxes. Where do the, all the, not just the president, but the other candidates we vote for, where do they line up with this thing about abortion? God lines up about Protecting the baby, right? He's against abortion. Where's the candidate line up for that? For taxes. What what candidate is taxing you to death? Being really unscriptural many a time. Which one is trying to maybe save you a little bit of money? Go on maybe not quite as much as what the word of God says that we're all supposed to give how much to your church? Ten percent. How many love for someone to have the tax code be below ten percent? Wouldn't that be nice? How do I can have a little bit more money in your pocketbook, right? And then next last Sunday morning, I talked about peace. Sunday morning about peace. There's a time for peace, there's a time for war sometimes. I talk about peace. The last night I talked about the environment. The environment. There's one candidate that's, you know, kind of trying to be conservative, but take care of the environment. There's another one that's last Sunday night that's trying to have our country spend two trillion dollars. On the new Green Deal. I'm worried about, worried about saving manatees and, uh, and woodpeckers versus saving babies. That's what it boils down to. How many believe God is more interested in saving babies than saving woodpeckers and manatees and spotted owls and kangaroo rats? We could go on on that. We're going to go on on that, but I believe the opinions of me and you don't matter. What matters is the Word of God. God says we're to humble ourselves. Too many people don't care. What Even what I'm saying from the Word of God because of their opinion. We're going on. Humble ourselves. Number two, the second thing we must do is pray. Pray. I'm not going to, but if I would ask, how many of you believe in prayer? All of us that would have heard me say, that's me, Pastor. Yeah, you'd all say, yeah, I believe in prayer. But I wonder how many of us are like, really do it unless the going gets tough. Sweet hour prayer. I mean, how many of us like really spend like, Time, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avail of much. Kind of, you know, the 2016 election, I believe, and many others, all with all my heart, I believe it was turned around because people of God were, were praying. There were certain prayer meetings that happened at a specific point in time. When the specific point in time that prayer meeting started, the election just changed. And I believe God has shown grace and mercy in our country. These last four years, I'm not going to break that message I have down right now for that, but I'll be with all my heart that turned around because of prayer. 
You know, God still answers prayer. And our country is in need of that today. What do we, what we must do? Humble ourselves, and get back to the Bible, and pray. And thirdly, seek God's face. What does that mean? Humble ourselves, no matter our opinion, and pray and seek God's face. That means with excitement. Seeking God's face with excitement. That means when we come to church, we I mean, come to church with excitement. Excitement. That's kind of like this, what I used to do. I used to be so excited when I first got saved that I got to come to church. Late in bed Saturday night, the next I got to come to church. You know what? I heard Jack Hollis preach oh, one of the first sermons I ever heard preached in 1994 after I got saved. He started talking, try to encourage, you could say encourage the church members to amen. Now get this, I went to a Lutheran church like my whole life. And I started going to a Baptist church a little bit because my girlfriend went. It wasn't a very big church. And I met a few people amen a little bit, but I, I don't think I ever really did. He was at Starlight Baptist Church. Kurt, can you help me with that door if you could real quick for me, please, if you follow me? Uh, at Starlight Baptist Church there in Orlando, Dr. Mickey Carter got to preach on the King James Bible, and it was an amazing sermon. And then there was a little of a break, and Jack Hiles got up and he started preaching, and he, I was like, I was like in awe. He had the, the, the power of God was upon him. The building was packed. Up. He started like encouraging the the. Church, the church there just like start amen and shout. I don't remember exactly how he did it, but you know, he's like motivating everybody to praise God in church. And I, I think I, that's the first time I kind of like grunted in church a little bit. Well, how I exactly did it, I think I raised my hand a little bit. I amen, but like for the, for the first time, I was kind of like showing some excitement. And I was excited to be in church. And, that's what God says we're supposed to do. Seek His face. That means be excited to come to church and act like we are when we come to church. That means when we're praying, we're supposed to be excited. We go to God in, in prayer. How many of say, if I said, right, now you got a certain prayer request you would love for God to answer? You, you, get, you got one. You got one? When you pray, God says we're supposed to pray with excitement. The effectual, fervent prayer. That means with excitement and seeking God's face, and then we're to turn from our wicked ways. How many realizes there's a lot of wickedness going on in our country? Yeah. Abortion? Homosexuality? We could go on. There's a lot of wickedness going on, and God says we need to turn from it. And if we do, what does 2 Chronicles 7.14 say? will happen. God says He will hear from heaven. I believe that God still answers prayer. He answers prayer. There are some things that need to be turned around in our country. Not only I hope God answers prayers from us with the election, I hope He answers prayer for revival. Revival. No matter who wins the election in November the 3rd, we can still have revival. God will hear from heaven. Secondly, forgive our sin. Thirdly, heal our land. Revival. Revival is needed and revival is what I'm praying for. Praying for freedoms in our land. Freedom to come to church. Aren't you thankful you have a pastor that says, you know what? Let's come to church next Sunday and let's dress up Western. Amen. Isn't that nice? You can dress up blue jeans and a big old belt buckle next Sunday. Western. Break out your cowboy boots. How many of your boot fans around here? Got some boot fans. Break out the boots next Sunday morning if you got boots. Break out the belt buckle. Yeah. Break out the bandana next Sunday. Wear it on your head. Wear it wherever. Next Sunday. Break out the cowboy hat if you got a cowboy hat. Break it out. 
Because we got the freedom to do so. We got a freedom to come to church Wednesday night, seven o'clock. Talking about God and government. How many are enjoying that little small seed right on God and government? You enjoying that? Give me an amen. Thank you. Hoping I get one at least. Yeah, a little series. God and government. Steve's been getting them the CD every week. He loves it so much, don't you, Steve? Yeah, go ahead. Go for it. Please do so. We got the right to do so, do we not? Yeah. Freedom. Freedom to come to church. Freedom to do that. Freedom to bear on. Freedoms that we enjoy today. Freedom to invite somebody to church. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it. Freedom to pass out tracts. They're going to try to take it away eventually. Eventually try to take it away. Freedom to come to church and praise God and assemble together and invite others to come to get them under the gospel. Freedom to go to school and work tomorrow. Freedom to tell someone about the Lord. Isn't it a wonderful country we live in? We need to keep fighting for the freedoms that we have had through all these years and to keep them so the ones that we've enjoyed, our children, they can grow up in a country that we've been able to enjoy for all these years. Let's stand if we can, please. With heads bowed and eyes closed. Ask Brother Gene Whitmer if he could just go ahead. He wouldn't mind dismissing this in prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. I love you. See you Wednesday. You are dismissed.